Number 10. Button Phobia Imagine being terrified of something as harmless as a little plastic shirt button. Yes, button phobia is a thing, and it's every bit as strange as it sounds. The fancy name for fear of buttons is kumpunophobia. Try saying that three times fast without tripping over your tongue. For the few folks who have it, about 0.001% of people, buttons aren't cute or useful, they're the stuff of nightmares. The sight or even thought of buttons can make them shudder. If you're wearing a button down around a kumpunophobe, don't be surprised if they keep a 5-foot safety radius like you've got nuclear cooties. It sounds ridiculous, but to the person suffering, it's very real. One famous example? It's rumored Steve Jobs had a severe aversion to buttons, which, if true, might explain why Apple went all in on touchscreens and turtlenecks. I mean, what better way to cope with your button hatred than by inventing the iPhone and banishing buttons from technology? Talk about turning trauma into tech innovation. While most of us will never know the horror of a rogue button attack, for a tiny sliver of humanity, the struggle, and the dry cleaning bills for all those zipper hoodies, is real. And if you think button fear is bizarre, there are countless other odd phobias out there, from fear of clowns to fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. But buttons have a special place in the Phobia Hall of Fame for being so common, yet so creepy to those unlucky few. It just goes to show, your brain can decide anything is scary if it tries hard enough. In this case, a harmless shirt fastening becomes a source of dread. Try not to judge. After all, we all have something that gives us the heebie-jeebies. Looking at you, creepy dolls. Number 9. Phantom Phone Vibrations You're chilling, going about your day, when suddenly, buzz buzz, your phone in your pocket vibrates. You grab it, but there's no new message, no call, nothing. Congratulations, you just experienced the infamous phantom phone vibration. Your brain basically yelled, incoming text, when in reality, your phone is as silent as a mime in space. This happens to almost everyone with a cell phone these days. One study found nearly 9 in 10 people have felt these phantom buzzes. It's like your brain hates the idea of being left out so much that it starts inventing fake notifications. Loneliness level? Desperate. What's going on here? Think of your brain as an overeager intern, hyper alert for any sign of social interaction. It's so primed to detect a call or text that it interprets any little muscle twitch or outside vibration as phone call. Did your pants shift? Could be a notification. Wind blew your pocket flap? Definitely a message. The result? You feel a buzz that never happened. It's basically a hallucination. But don't worry, it doesn't mean you're losing it. It just means you and your phone have an unhealthy relationship and maybe you should see other people. Literally. Phantom vibrations are a modern brain quirk, a symptom of our always-on lifestyle. Our anxious minds would rather give us a false alarm than risk missing out. Ever find yourself checking your phone again because you swore it moved? Yep, that's your frazzled nervous system playing tricks. On the bright side, at least these ghost buzzes remind us how attached we are to our gadgets. As if we needed another reminder. The next time your thigh rings when no one's calling, just tell your brain, thanks for nothing, drama queen, and carry on. Number eight, the I am illusion. Let's play a game. Say this out loud. I am confident. Feel different? You might not be ready to strut onto a TED Talk stage, but somewhere deep in the meatloaf that is your subconscious, a little light just flickered on. That's because your brain doesn't just hear what you say, it listens like it's eavesdropping through a hotel wall. And when you say, I am anything, your brain starts acting like it's under contract to make it true. Psychologists call this self-affirmation theory. When you make an I am statement, your brain does a little dance between belief and behavior. Even if you don't totally believe it, your mind starts rearranging furniture to make the room match the label. Say, I am disciplined enough times, and suddenly you're organizing your desktop folders like it's the Olympics. It's like your brain has FOMO for consistency. It wants your identity and your actions to match. So when you declare something, it sets out on a mission to make it real, just so it doesn't feel like a liar. But here's the wild twist. This works even if the affirmation feels slightly fake at first. Why? Because your brain is obsessed with cognitive dissonance, the psychological equivalent of a crooked picture frame. 
it can't stand the mismatch between what you say and how you act, so it tries to fix the gap. Either you become the person you say you are, or you stop saying it. The trick is to keep saying it until your actions catch up. Basically, you can out-stubborn your own brain. So, yes, words can rewire you, or at least gaslight your own ego into stepping up. Just don't go overboard. I am Beyonce might be pushing it. Number 7. Mirror talk is black magic. Ever caught yourself talking to your reflection in the mirror? Like full-on TED talk mode with hand gestures and eyebrow raises? If not, you're either lying or overdue for a breakdown. Talking to yourself in the mirror isn't just peak movie montage behavior. It's a powerful psychological tool. It's called mirror self-recognition mixed with self-affirmation, and it's basically your brain giving itself a pep talk with visual receipts. Here's why it works. When you talk to yourself in the mirror, you're activating both verbal and visual identity circuits. Your brain hears you and sees you, which makes the affirmation hit harder. It's like giving your words a LinkedIn endorsement from your own eyeballs. Scientists have found that people who perform affirmations in front of a mirror report higher levels of confidence and goal commitment. You're not just saying, I can do this. You're making eye contact with your own doubt and drop kicking it through the glass. And here's the freaky part. Mirror self-talk can actually reduce stress biomarkers in your body. Your cortisol levels lowered. Your heart rate calmed. Your inner critic shushed like an annoying toddler in a movie theater. Some studies even show improved performance on tests in public speaking after just a few minutes of mirror affirmations. It's not magic. It's just your brain being extremely gullible in the best way possible. So next time you're about to face something terrifying, a job interview, a Tinder date, or explaining your tax deductions, hit the mirror and remind yourself, I've got this. Loudly. Like you mean it because apparently you can bluff your way into actual confidence. Number six, your brain believes the lie. Eventually, say something long enough and your brain just shrugs and files it under fact. That's the psychological loophole known as illusory truth effect. Basically, if you repeat a statement, even if it's total nonsense, enough times, your brain starts treating it like gospel. Yes, even your brain, the thing that's supposed to be smart, this is how affirmations sneak in and squat inside your subconscious like a con artist with a fake lease. Repetition makes them familiar, and familiarity equals truth in your brain's lazy logic system. Think of it as the cognitive version of Stockholm Syndrome. Your neurons hear, I am successful, so many times they eventually throw up their hands and say, fine, I guess we are then, let's roll. It's the same reason catchy slogans, political propaganda, and viral misinformation all work. Repetition doesn't just get attention. It wears down skepticism. Your brain is a pattern-seeking, energy-saving machine. If it's heard a phrase 30 times, it saves processing power by skipping the whole fact-checking part. It's like a lazy librarian who says, uh, I've seen this book a bunch. Must be good. Put it in the truth section. So what does that mean for affirmations? It means you can trick your own brain into changing through sheer stubborn repetition. You say, I am confident a hundred times, and eventually your brain will stop side-eyeing you and just let the belief slide through security unchecked. Kind of like sneaking into a club by pretending you've already been inside. Works more often than it should. Of course, this also means your brain will believe negative affirmations. Say, I'm a failure every morning, and guess what? Your brain's like, roger that, Captain Doom Spiral. So be careful what you repeat. Your subconscious is listening, and it doesn't do sarcasm. Number five, the name tag effect. Ever been to a conference, slapped on a name tag, and suddenly felt different? Like, just by wearing a sticker that says marketing director, you start standing a little taller and using words like synergy unironically. That, my friend, is the name tag effect. And it's one of the weirdest quirks in the psychology of identity. The act of labeling yourself, even with a literal label, can trigger something called self-perception theory. 
It's the idea that you infer your internal state by observing your own behavior or appearance. Your brain sees the name tag, the title, the hello, I am, and starts thinking, well, I must be this person, right? Boom, micro identity activated. This is exactly how affirmations work. When you say, I am a leader, or I am healthy, it's like mentally slapping on a fancy conference badge. And just like that, your behavior starts shifting to match the role. You might make eye contact more, eat one less sad desk snack, use the word optimize in a sentence. Because your brain, bless its gullible little circuits, wants to act in line with the name tag you just handed it. Now, does this mean you can walk around wearing a sticker that says billionaire and expect your bank account to listen? Not quite. But psychologically, you'll start acting like someone with more confidence, more agency, and that behavior change can lead to actual outcomes. Identity influences action and action creates results, even if your billionaire sticker is just a post-it note with dreams on it. Moral of the story? Be very careful what you call yourself. Your brain is listening, and it loves a costume party. Number four, placebo, but make it personal. What do sugar pills and positive self-talk have in common? They both fool your body into reacting like something real just happened. Welcome to the placebo effect, that wonderful, slightly shady mind-body contract where belief alone changes physical outcomes. And guess what? Affirmations work the same psychological alleyway. When you say something like, I'm getting better every day, you're not just speaking into the void, you're dosing yourself with a personalized placebo. Your body hears the message, your brain releases a few feel-good chemicals like dopamine and endorphins, and suddenly, you do start feeling better. Even if nothing else in your life has changed, your internal pharmacy goes, well, the boss said we're fine, so I guess we're fine. This isn't just woo-woo nonsense. Studies show that believing something is helping you, even if it technically isn't, can still cause measurable physiological improvements. We're talking lowered blood pressure, improved immune responses, even reduced pain. And here's where it gets trippy. Your brain doesn't care whether it's a fake pill or a powerful sentence. If it believes the suggestion, your body plays along like it's on a movie set and method acting the role of well-adjusted human. Affirmations, then, are like verbal medicine, minus the side effects and copay. You tell yourself, I am calm, and your nervous system starts to ease off the panic pedal. Say it every day, and the habit builds a new normal. You become the placebo. You're the sugar pill with a six-figure vocabulary. But there's a catch. Just like actual placebos, affirmations don't work if you roll your eyes while doing them. You need just enough belief to prime your subconscious into compliance. So next time you're stuck in traffic, late for everything, and one podcast away from a nervous breakdown, try whispering, I am in control. Worst case, you look slightly unhinged. Best case, you actually start to believe it. Number three, labels are brain shackles. Ever been told you're the shy one, or the smart one, or heaven forbid, the difficult one? Congrats, you've been branded and your brain probably still hasn't forgiven them. See, labels aren't just passive observations, they're psychological handcuffs. And once you've got one on, your brain starts reshaping your identity to match it. This psychological trap is called labeling theory, and it's part of how society and your inner critic sneakily reprogram your self-image. When someone says, you're bad at math, your brain hears that not as a one-time thing, but as a character trait. And like an overachieving stage actor, it starts committing to the role. Before you know it, you're avoiding spreadsheets like they're radioactive, just to stay on brand. Affirmations work like anti-labels. They're your way of shouting over the noise and slapping on a new name tag, one that you chose. If you say, I'm a problem solver every day, your brain starts scanning your life for evidence. Hey, I did fix the Wi-Fi last week. Maybe I am competent. Slowly, it rewires your mental narrative from I suck at this to maybe I don't. But the same process cuts both ways. Say, I'm lazy, often enough, even jokingly, and your brain's like, ah, yes, laziness, our new brand identity. Deploy procrastination mode. Your words don't just describe reality. They create it. So be strategic. 
Label yourself with purpose. Don't hand your brain a trashy nickname and expect elite results. You're not a mess. You're in beta. Big difference. Number two, future you is just you with better PR. Let's talk about future you, the mythical creature who wakes up early, eats vegetables voluntarily, and somehow never loses their car keys. Everyone loves future you. They're a productivity demigod with six-pack abs and a bullet journal. The problem? Future you doesn't exist unless present you starts lying like a motivational speaker on espresso. This brings us to a juicy psychological trick, perspective self-affirmation. When you say, I am becoming more organized, you're not lying. You're casting a vote for future you. The magic happens in the tense. Becoming tells your brain, we're in motion. We're not there yet, but the GPS is set. And that gentle fiction helps bridge the gap between who you are and who you want to be. See, your brain hates uncertainty. So when you say something like, I will be successful, it tries to resolve that tension by nudging your behavior toward the goal. You start making micro decisions that align with the affirmation, not because you're trying to be perfect, but because you've told your brain you're already on the path. You're not becoming someone else. You're evolving like Pokemon but with more caffeine and fewer sparkles. It's sneaky, but effective. Instead of saying, I want to be confident, which makes your brain say, cool, someday, maybe, whatever. You say, I am becoming confident, and your brain goes, oh crap, we're doing this now? Better act apart. It's like psychologically soft launching your better self. Bottom line, affirmations about the future trick your brain into acting now. You're not manifesting magic. You're manipulating momentum. It's not lying. It's just really aggressive optimism. Number one, the word that starts it all. Here it is. The one word that can literally change who you are. I. Just two letters. Looks harmless. Sounds innocent. But oh boy, is it loaded. The moment you say I, you're not just describing something. You're declaring ownership. You're planting your flag in identity territory. I am anxious. I am unstoppable. I am trash. I am healing. These aren't just phrases. They're neural contracts. Your subconscious doesn't see them as metaphors. It sees them as blueprints. And it starts building. This is the terrifying and beautiful power of self-talk. The word I fast tracks everything that comes after it straight into your identity. Say, I am angry, and your body complies. Tension, heartbeat, stress hormones. Say, I am calm, and your brain at least tries to de-escalate. It's not perfect, but it's powerful. Even your inner monologue listens. Ever catch yourself saying, I always screw things up after a minor mistake? That's a rogue affirmation, buddy. And it's carving a new groove in your brain every time you say it. You're basically affirming failure with the enthusiasm of a motivational speaker on the wrong team. The fix? Be mindful. Swap I am anxious for I'm feeling anxious. Subtle but critical, you're no longer declaring identity. You're describing a temporary state. And when you do want to change who you are, slap that I am in front of what you want to be and say it like to mean it. Because that little word, it's a psychological paintbrush. Use it carelessly, and you graffiti your self-worth. Use it intentionally, and you craft your character. So yeah, one word. Infinite consequences. Wild, right? That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.